All right. Hey, good morning. My name is Chris. I'm the pastor here at Christian Chapel. Advent is a great time for you to invite people to come to Christian Chapel with you. Next Sunday uh, is a great Sunday to do that. Next Sunday is one of my favorite uh, five-minute segments of any of our services that we do all year long. It is the preschool Christmas choir next Sunday, um, which feels, fills every parent with just a little bit of fear of what might my child do and fills me with a whole lot of excitement of what might your child do. Um, and so I, you know, I normally, I don't have kids that age anymore, but I still have my phone out just to catch the spontaneous moments of worship uh, that your preschooler may or may not engage in. It's almost as fun as Palm Sunday, because uh, at least on Palm Sunday, we give them weapons. Uh, so they've got the little palm branches that they can, Christmas is a little more put together, but still, that'll be next Sunday. So I'm looking forward to seeing some of you parents, grandparents, right down here in those first three rows uh, where you never sit at any other point. But next week, I can make eye- awkward eye contact with you. Um, all through the service because you're determined to get that good picture of your kids. So be here next week for that. Bring your aunts, uncles, grandmas, grandpas. Uh, It's going to be a good Sunday. And then also, when you leave uh, this morning out at the Welcome Center, there are some of these Christmas Eve um, invites. So I want to encourage you, grab one of those, take it to work, take it to your neighborhood, give it to a friend, a family member, um, invite them to Christmas Eve services with you. That is a week from Tuesday, believe it or not. It is almost here. And so we're doing two services services at 5.30 and at 7, so we'd love to see you there for that. We also want to make another way available for you to get that invitation out. If you know the address of your friend or family member, which you probably don't because we don't even know each other's phone numbers anymore, but get your phone out, shoot them a text right now, say, hey, what's your address? And then on your way by the Welcome Center, stop by. There's some pens or some cards. Write it on there, and then we will mail that out to them tomorrow. You can include a little note there on the back if you want to, but we want to be part of helping as many people as possible possible, experience the power and the presence of Jesus. This Christmas and Christmas Eve services are a wonderful way for us to do that. So during Advent this year, this is the third Sunday of Advent. If you're unfamiliar with Advent, it's the four Sundays that lead up to Christmas. Advent means arrival, and so we're celebrating the arrival of Jesus, and we're also looking forward to his return to his second arrival. And this year during Advent, we have talked about how Jesus moves towards us. In every season of life, no matter what we're going through, Jesus is God's ultimate demonstration that he has moved, he is moving, and he will continue to move for us. And today what I want to do is look at Luke chapter 2, specifically at the story of Simeon. We're going to talk about what it looks like to wait on a move. Um, I don't know, is there anybody here who enjoys waiting? Okay, good. You never know if there's like the one crazy person that's like, love it. I just go stand in line sometimes for fun. I don't even need anything. I just, like the sentence I have never spoke and will never speak in my life is I can't wait to wait. It doesn't make any sense. It's why um, I'm not a big fan of amusement parks, right? Because I get to spend a lot of money to wait and be hot and be miserable and then feel nauseous after I finally get to the end of the line and the, the big surprise at the end, right? So, so it's, it's just, there's not, we don't enjoy it in any way. The only thing we're actually good waiting on are things we don't want, right? Like I can wait all day for kale smoothies, be the most patient man in the world. Like, nope, you give them to everybody else. I can wait for dentist appointments. I can wait to be audited by the IRS. I can wait for your angry emails. Um, I can wait years for Angie to say, we need to talk. Uh, Like there's just, there's all kinds of things I can wait for and you can wait for. But when it comes to things I want, then my patience goes away. Right, and, and you know the same thing. And it's one thing to, to be impatient just waiting on the little details of life, but when you're waiting on the big things, when you're waiting to be loved, when you're waiting to be healed, when you're waiting to welcome a child into your family, when you're waiting to find Mr. or Miss Wright, when you're waiting on the right job, when you're waiting on the home to sell or waiting on the home to go for sale, when you're waiting on the business deal to close, when you're waiting in any of these spaces for the depression to lift, for the grief to go away, for the season of mourning to come to an end, in all of those spaces, waiting is especially painful. And waiting is painful for us, first of all, because it highlights the distance between where we are and where we want to be. And in a season of waiting, I'm constantly having to look ahead to the promise and see that my life right now does not yet match that. Waiting is also painful because it highlights my lack of control. 
If you think of most of the things in life that you hate to wait on, it's because someone else is involved in that process. And so you're waiting on them to make decisions. You're waiting for them to make a move. You're waiting for them to have some change of heart. You're waiting for them to take some kind of action. And it it just kind of shows us how much of our life rests in the hands of others, sometimes those that we know, sometimes those that we don't know. And so into all of these seasons of waiting, the story of Advent, the story of the first arrival of Christ comes and speaks very clearly and powerfully to us about how we wait, why we wait, and how God works in the season of waiting. So in Luke chapter 2, we find the story of Simeon. We're going to read it. It's a little more extended, so hang in there with me. If you don't have a Bible to be here on the screens for you, we're going to start in verse 22. So this takes place after the birth of Jesus. And it says, when the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took him, being Jesus, to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Now, there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for the revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, this child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. Now, we're going to kind of work through this story this morning. We'll see a few things that Simeon teaches us. But the first thing I I want you to understand, if you are in a season of waiting this morning, you're in good company, right? It's not that there's something wrong with you. It's not that everyone around has everything they want and you're the only one who has a, a distance between what you desire and what you experience. But all of us here today are in a season of waiting in one way or another. There's a part of our heart that is not yet fulfilled. There's a part of our experience that is not what we hope it will be. And even if life is 95% perfect, that last 5% is still going to grab a lot of our attention. It's going to cause a lot of heartache, a lot of headache, and a lot of questions for us. And in that space, the message of Advent is, you're okay. We are all waiting. Now again, it might help to to think of how Advent works. So Advent, think of it as as kind of two posts or two pillars. So the first pillar of Advent is the arrival of Jesus, right? The the incarnation, the birth of the baby, the passage that that we're reading from in Luke chapter 2 tells the story of the first arrival. And the first arrival of Jesus means that his kingdom has now been inaugurated. And so he's come to restore and renew. He's come to be the resurrection and the life. He's come to be the way to the Father. He's come that the same spirit that raises him from the dead will now dwell in you and me. And he gives us all these promises of forgiveness, of restoration, of redemption, of renewed relationships with each other, of significance and purpose, of healing and hope. All of these things come with the first advent, the first arrival of Jesus. And yet, his first arrival also points towards his second arrival, his second advent, the second coming when he will wipe every tear from every eye, when he will perfectly finally renew and restore, when he will drive away all remnants and traces of evil, where we will exist perfectly in relationship with him and with each other. And so he's inaugurated this kingdom, but he has not yet fully and finally fulfilled it. And you and I live in this land in between, which will always and forever be a land of waiting until he returns. And so for some of us, when when it comes to this idea of waiting on God to move, it's coming to an acceptance of waiting will always be part of my experience. 
Because I'm always waiting for perfection. I'm always waiting for fulfillment. I'm always waiting for the absolute complete redemption of all things and all creation. And until that day comes, there will always be a longing in my heart and life that is unfulfilled. And so what that means today is that your life will never be perfect. And that's where a lot of our frustration comes from. Like, God, I'm not asking for much. I'm just asking for perfection for myself, for my family, for my job, for my kids. I I don't need much, God. Just help everybody to never make any mistakes again that cause any drama in my life. You ever found yourself praying those prayers of like, God, life would be perfect if you could just straighten up everyone else. Like, just fix them. And so, so I kind of want to set us free from that today. So I'm, I'm not a big uh, repeat-after-me kind of preacher normally, okay? But I'm going to ask you to, and you have to do it, or I'm going to point you out, and it's going to be weird, okay? So uh, just, just very simply, I'm going to say two words. You're going to say them back to me, okay? My life, My life. Will, never will never be perfect. Be perfect. All right, one more time. My life, My life. Will, never will never be perfect. Okay, now for some of you, there is something inside of you that rises up even as you say that. And you're like, you don't know me. You don't know how hard I can work. You don't know how smart I am. You don't know how much I can control, right? So you should probably go home and write that in every room of your house. Maybe paint it on the outside of your house. Just over and over and over and over and over again. Because the message of the scriptures is very clear, right? This is not some kind of like, hey, I'm just going to grind it out of you. This is what the gospel teaches us. Our lives will never be perfect until Christ returns. Because as long as the remnants of sin remain in the world, we're going to continue to suffer some of the effects of those. And one of the effects of sin is that there is a gap between God's promises, and God's fulfillment. This is just the reality in which we live. Now, for others of us, when we say those words, my life will never be perfect, it feels like a weight is being lifted off our shoulders. It's like, well, great. You know, because not only will it not be, but God doesn't expect it to be. No one else expects it to be. You're the only one that's surprised when things go bad in your life. Right? I mean, and I'm guilty of it too. Like things go bad and I kind of look like, God, why? Why is this happening? Why are you doing this? And everyone else can look from the outside objectively and say, because we live in a world that's been tainted by sin. And yes, we have the experiences of Christ. And yes, we have the promises of Christ. We have his power. We have his presence living in us. And yet we live in the land in between his first coming and his second coming. And that land is a land of waiting. And it will always involve personal seasons of waiting for us. And so if you find yourself in a season of waiting, then what you've got to do is you've got to start to check your promises that you're holding on to and see, are these promises that Christ has given to me and that he will fulfill, or am I latching my life onto things that he has never promised to give me in the first place? So for Simeon, he says that he was waiting for the consolation of Israel. Now, this was a promise that went back to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It was reiterated in Moses, reiterated to David of God saying, hey, I'm going to establish my throne forever. All kingdoms, all nations, all people will know me through you. And when Simeon is alive, he is waiting, praying, hoping, longing for the consolation of Israel because Israel has fallen quite a ways down from where they used to be. And so in Simeon's mind, the consolation of Israel means the arrival of the Messiah who comes to conquer, to rule, to reign. He believes that it will be the restoration of Israel. It will be the expulsion of the Roman Empire. It will be the reestablishment of the Davidic kingdom times a thousand. This is what the consolation of Israel means. But Simeon, he has this big promise from God. But then underneath that promise, he has received a personal promise. It says the Holy Spirit was on him. And the Holy Spirit had revealed to Simeon he would not die until he saw the Lord's Messiah. And there's a a model that is created here that should teach us about the way that we wait. Simeon's personal promise came secondary to God's big promise. And it's the same thing in my life, the same thing in your life. Every personal promise that God has given to me has to fit under the bigger promises he's given to us. So how do we check our promises? It's, it's It's really pretty easy. First, you go to the scriptures and you start to read through them and and you can look and see, does this thing I'm holding on to, does this line up with what God has revealed to it? So if you're married right now and and life isn't going well, 
right? And, and you've got this dream, and you're starting to think, I think God has promised me that I'm going to get a better spouse than this one. There's another Mr. Right out there, and it's not this guy, right? So, so again, now we're just going to take that, and we're going to put it under the scriptures, and we're going to pretty quickly learn, you know, husband of, of, one, of one wife, wife of one husband, this is how God works. There's not really, there's some allowances made, but that's because of the brokenness of the world. And so God's perfect plan for you is never going to be to leave your husband for your high school flame. Right? So we're just going to subject that to the promise. And, and we even now sit here and we're like, well, people don't do that. People do that all the time. And, and you know what else we do? We, we love to say that God has told us we can do things that are expressly forbidden in the scriptures. No, no, no. The Lord spoke. He does not speak in ways that contradict what he has already said. So the first way we're going to check our promise is we're just going to surrender it to the scriptures. The second way we're going to check the promise is we're going to surrender it in prayer. And we're going to start saying, Lord, is this from you? Because there's a lot of promises we hold on to that there, I mean, you know, the, the promises of how your 401k will perform, you can't find any clues to that in Deuteronomy. Like they just, they, they, they don't, they did not talk about the stock market much. They talked about bulls, so you can try to read into that, but it's not going to, it's not going to help you, right? So, so it's scriptures, but then also prayer. And we're just going to say, Lord, speak to me, show me. If this is from you, give me peace about it. If this is from you, build faith in my heart. If this is from you, encourage me to keep walking down this path. And then the third way we're going to check our promise is we're going to surrender it to the community of faith where God has placed us. And we're going to start saying to others, hey, I think God has put this in my heart. Can you help me discern this? Can you help me see, are there scriptures that speak about this? Can you pray with me and let me know what the Lord is saying to you? And as we kind of begin to engage in that process, there is a surrender of the promises we're holding on to. And we're basically saying, Lord, if this is from you, give it back. And if it's not, take it away. But this is a vital place for us to spend some time in a season of waiting because sometimes we get really, really frustrated because God is not fulfilling promises that he never made to us. We have chosen to call our daydreams and our pipe dreams the promises of God, thinking that somehow we can supernaturally manipulate God into doing what we want. But as you read through the scriptures, the promises that are fulfilled are the promises that are made by God. It's about God's promises. It's about what he says, about what he does. And so if you kind of work your way through this process of I'm going to surrender it to the scriptures, I'm going to pray about it, surrender it to the Lord, I'm going to surrender it to the community of faith he's planted me in, and you're asking these questions and you feel like God is saying again and again and again, yes, this is from me, yes, this is from me, yes, this is from me, keep waiting. Then the question is, well, what do we do? Now, for Simeon, we don't know how much time passes between when God says, you will behold the Messiah, and when he holds Jesus in his arms. It, but it, it seems from the way the story is told, and, and from kind of Luke's emphasis in Luke 2 here, both with the story of Simeon and then also Anna, who, who accompanies it, is that there, there's this element of there is a, a, an extended waiting process at times to see God's hand at work in our lives. And so we don't know if this is days or weeks or months or years or decades for Simeon. But we, it seems like it has been quite a while. And for that whole period of time, Simeon models a response to waiting that you and I can continue to imitate today. And it's just this idea of in the waiting, I'm going to worship. I'm just going to keep worshiping. And so day after day, Simeon keeps going to the temple. He keeps offering his sacrifices. He keeps engaging in prayers. He keeps surrendering his life to the Lord. He keeps walking with the Spirit. I mean, just listen to how Simeon is described. He's described as righteous and devout, and the Holy Spirit is on him. So Simeon's described as someone who has an ongoing relationship with the Lord that is living, that's active, that's breathing, that's leading him and guiding him every step of the way. And we know those kind of relationships are fueled by worship. And so if you're in a spot this morning where you are waiting for a promise to be revealed, waiting for a promise to be confirmed, waiting for a promise to be actualized and fulfilled, my encouragement to you this morning is worship in the waiting. Because when you worship in the waiting, there's a couple things that happen. First of all, when I worship God while I'm waiting for his promise, it keeps my focus on the promise maker and keeps me from worshiping the promise that's been made. 
Because we see, we see this all the time, right? God comes and he promises, hey, uh, you know, I've told you, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother, be united to his wife, the two will become one flesh. And, and we say, yes, that's what I want. And then 22 comes and, and you're still single. And then 25 comes and you're still single. And then 30 and then 35 and, and it might keep going. And somewhere along the way, there's this temptation to start worshiping the promise. And thinking like my whole life revolves around, I gotta get married, I gotta get married, I gotta get married. Or, or maybe it's a child. Again, the scriptures promise that God will bless men and women with children, that they're a heritage from the Lord. They're a sign, a symbol of his blessing. And so we believe that the promise maker has given us this promise. But then the pregnancy tests are negative, and they're negative, and they're negative, and they're negative, and the doctors aren't helping, and there's miscarriages, and there's all kinds of pain and suffering that goes along with it. And at some point, there's a temptation in our pain to start worshiping the promise and thinking, if I can just have a baby, then everything will finally be okay. We do it with our jobs. We do it with our kids. We do it with our education. We do it with our finances. Where the promise maker has made promises about his ability to lead, to guide, to provide, to direct. But if we're not careful, if we stop worshiping and we only keep the promise, we will eventually worship the promise. And when you worship the promise, if it's delayed in any way, you quickly, quickly become bitter and angry. And you begin to think, well, why would God promise me things he has no intention of giving me? Why would God promise me that that we can have a thriving marriage when there seems to be no movement forward? Why would God put this desire for a child in my heart when he has no intention of honoring it? Why would God have have called me into this field if it was just going to be a struggle from start to finish? Why does God promise healing when my life's experience has been sickness? Why does he, if he really wanted to comfort me, why did he take my spouse away from me? We have all of these things. And if we begin to focus just on the promises, just on the circumstances, circumstances and stop worshiping the promise maker, then we're going to start believing the lies that God maybe doesn't see us, or he does see us, but he doesn't care, or he does see us and he cares, but he's not strong enough to do anything about it. And so this is why worship is so important. When we worship in the waiting, we are constantly telling ourselves the truth about who God is, about what he has promised, and about how he is at work in every situation. And so worship becomes an opportunity for me to turn my eyes off the promise, no matter how good it might be, and put them back on the promise maker, who is the one who initiated it, the one who is working, and the one who will ultimately secure it. Worship softens my heart. Worship protects my mind. Worship guards my relationships because it's constantly telling me these are God's promises, not yours. He's at work. He's moving. He's active. Pay attention to him regardless of what's going on around you. And so now now worship, obviously, it involves reading the scriptures on your own. It involves personal times of devotion and prayer. It involves moments like this morning where we're going to gather together and we're going to sing and we're going to hear the the scriptures preached and we're going to respond to them. This is all worship, and yet worship also involves obedience. It involves action. It involves movement. And so when you're in a season of waiting, one of the ways you worship is you keep doing the last thing God told you to do, right? So God might have promised something in a family. He might have promised something in a career. He might have promised something in a relationship. He might have promised something financially, and you've you've checked it, and it's lined up, and others have confirmed it, and now you're just in a season of waiting, and, and so, so two things here, we're going to keep doing the last thing, and we're going to keep doing the next thing that Jesus calls us to do. Worship always involves in beat obedience, and waiting always involves movement. You see that for some of us, we give in to this idea of, of waiting paralysis, of if I'm waiting on God for one thing, then I can't do anything. So Lord, I, I want to get married, and, and I'm not doing anything else. Until you do that, I'm not going to give, I'm not going to serve, I'm not going to take these steps of faith. Lord, until you do this, I'm not moving forward. God, I want that baby. Until I hold her, until I hold him in my arms, I'm not taking another step of faith. I'm not moving forward. I don't believe you love me until you answer this prayer. God, until you heal me, I'm not reaching out to anyone else. I'm not making an investment in other people. 
I'm staying right here until you do something about it. But all through the scriptures, what you see is as men and women of God are waiting on the promises of God to be fulfilled, they still have a a, a responsibility to keep doing the last thing and keep doing the next thing. Your waiting on his promises does not mean that all of life stops until he fulfills them. He's still working. He's still moving, he's still calling, he's still leading, he's still guiding. And in that process, you're being reminded, God is not looking for perfect people whose all of his promises have been perfectly fulfilled. He's looking for people who are going to trust him in the process, who are going to keep growing, keep following, keep obeying. Why? Because ultimately, waiting is a season of growth. Mark Batterson wrote a a book called The Circle Maker. It's a great book on prayer. I'd I'd recommend it to you. Uh, But he has a a chapter in there where he talks about praying long, right? Where we're just praying long prayers. And and sometimes those prayers aren't answered quickly. And sometimes we die without seeing some of our prayers answered at all. And Batterson does a great job in these chapters of kind of diving into some of these ideas of the sovereignty of God and the eternal nature of our prayers. And and there's some really fascinating stuff. But there's, there's one little idea from in there that I want to share with you this morning. Batterson says, because we are surrounded by technologies that make our lives faster and easier, we tend to think about spiritual realities in those terms. But almost all spiritual realities in Scripture are described in longer and harder agricultural terms. We want things to happen at the speed of light instead of happening at the speed of a seed planted in the ground. And I read that and I'm just like, yeah, that's like, now that's me. God, I love your promises. Will you do them now? All of them? Every single one of them? Every promise for my, my personal life, every promise in my heart, every promise at Christian Chapel, every promise in my marriage, every promise in my family, every promise for my children, every promise for my friendships, every promise of restoration and reconciliation, all of, Lord, can you just do them all now. And if I'm not careful, I start to live with that expectation because everything else in life comes like that. Right? I mean, you see this. Just our, our culture as a whole is, is an instant access culture. How many of you, when you were kids, you would be driving down the road and you would ask one of your parents a question and they would say, I don't know? Anybody? Right? Some of you had parents that just made stuff up and you thought they were the smartest person in the world and then later in life you're like, that is not at all how windmills work. My dad was, there are not little sprites that come out of the ground and turn the wind. You know, so, but, but 20, 30 years ago, I don't know was an acceptable answer. I don't know. Okay, fine. I guess I don't need to know that. I mean, I'd drive down the road with my dad and ask him, like, Dad, what, what is this about? I don't know. What do you think that business does? I don't know. When I drive down the highway with my kids, anything I say I don't know to, you know what their first response is? Ask Siri. Ask Siri. We live in a world where you can know everything all of the time, where everything is instant, everything is available. Like, I mean, I grew up, and most of us did in this room, in the age of drive-thrus. Like, I knew what it was like. If I was hungry, I could drive to McDonald's as a high schooler back when that didn't kill me, uh, you know, and, and I, could, I could have the quarter pounder with cheese. But, but today, I don't even have to drive to McDonald's anymore. I can get my fast food delivered to me in my office. How lazy is that, right? Like, just have you ever stopped to think about your life choices when you're having McDonald's delivered to you? Like on a scale of one to ten, how horrible. It's a 12, right? It's, a, it's just that's where it is. But, but we live in a culture, everything, all of the time. All of the time. Like, I, you know, you don't have to miss a game ever because you can stream it on your phone. You can watch it later. You have instant access to everything all of the time. And then we come to the promises of God, some of these big life-altering promises. And he says, I'm going to do it in my time. I'm going to do it for you. When you're ready, waiting as a season of growth reminds us that we are rarely capable of handling the fulfillment of God's promise the moment he gives it to us. The first time he puts that dream in your heart is the beginning of a process where he's preparing you to be able to steward the end result. 
And sometimes that process is longer because we have a lot to learn. For me, I know sometimes that process is longer because I am stubborn and I am quick to take the glory for myself. And so I know God works slower in my life so that that there is a, a constant refining in me of saying, Lord, if this ever happens, it is all by your hand and all by your work, and I won't be able to take any of the credit at all for it. In these seasons of waiting, God is growing us deeper. He is maturing us so that when his answer comes, we are ready to receive it. So that means the season of waiting should not be despised. If you're a single person this morning, it's not just about the wedding day. It's about who are you becoming right here and right now? How is God working? How is God leading? How is he revealing? The best gift that you can give to that future Mr. or Miss Wright is a heart that is fully devoted to Jesus. And if if you're in a season of waiting saying, God, we we want a family. Lord, that's what we want. It's, It's not ultimately about the positive pregnancy test. It's not about delivery day in the hospital. When God fulfills it, those days may come. But right now, it's just about you and your spouse learning to trust, learning to obey, learning to believe that in the dark nights of the soul, when the pain seems like it will never go away, Jesus is still enough. In the seasons of questioning, God, is the business going to sell? God, is the business going to succeed? God, is this going to work? It's not just about one day when it all finally does. It's about learning to trust him, learning to believe him, learning to steward what he's put in my hands in these moments, learning to be faithful with a few things so that someday, if he sees fit, I can be faithful with many. There are always lessons to be learned in the waiting. And no matter how old we are, what season of life we find ourselves in this morning, there is something that we're waiting for, and there is something that God is trying to teach us in the waiting. And so I know, I know, I know how, that, how, it, how it feels to hear those things. Because sometimes it just feels like, Lord, what else are you going to teach me? I'm tired of learning, honestly. Like, can, you, can, I just, can I settle for a lesser promise with less teaching? You know, can, I'll, take like, I'll take a C on that promise, Lord. That's fine. I don't, I don't need the A fulfillment. Just give me the C, and I want to do some C work to get it. And we just kind of have these thoughts. And, and if you're waiting, I don't, I don't mean to minimize your pain. I don't, I don't want to minimize your suffering. I just want you to understand you will never go through a season in life that is beyond God's ability to work in and work through. And the waiting, it's not always the result of God looking at you and saying, you're not ready for this. Sometimes we're waiting because there are sinful people in the world. And they are making sinful choices. And it is affecting us. And it's pushing God away and his ability to work in those situations. It's it's hindering him in some way. Sometimes he's, he's not fulfilling those promises because there's sin in our life. Sometimes it's just we live in a broken world and we're just going to live with that longing for his second coming. But in the waiting, God always works. He never stops working. He never stops promising. He never stops fulfilling. Simeon, there had to be some days that he wondered, is this going to happen? He wasn't getting any younger, right? As soon as he holds Jesus, what's he say? Now I can die in peace. Take me, Lord. I mean, it kind of gives us this little picture of Simeon is just hanging on to life until he sees the promise of the Lord. Have you ever been there with a friend or a family member where they've said, like, you know what, I'm just, I'm ready to go home. I'm just, I'm, I'm done. I got nothing left to do, nothing left to achieve. Jesus can just take me now. I remember having those, those conversations with my grandpa the past couple years. I'm saying, I'm just, I'm just done. I'm ready to go. He, there was nothing left for him to hold on to anymore. And he was at peace, and he was at rest, and he said, let's go. And so Simeon, it seems like when we read this passage, the only thing he's holding on to is, Lord, you said I would see the Messiah. So give me until that day. And then one day Simeon is moved by the Spirit. Luke says, moved by the Spirit, he goes into the temple. And as he's standing in the temple, we don't know what he's doing, if he's praying, if he's worshiping, if he's just watching and waiting. But suddenly he sees this this poor young couple walk in. They've got a tiny little newborn baby boy in their arms. And in that moment, something confirms to Simeon, this is the promise you've waited for. Now, here's a couple things to pay attention to. Simeon walked with the Spirit. 
And Simeon was moved by the Spirit to be in the temple that day. God's promises are God's promises. And he will take all of the action that is needed for his promises to be fulfilled in your life in his time. And yet, Simeon still had to leave his house and walk to the temple. He was moved by the Spirit to go to the temple, but he had to physically move to the temple. And so in seasons of waiting, they're God's promises. He's going to fulfill them in his time, in his way. His spirit is going to speak, but the day is going to come where he's going to say, now. Right? You've been, you've been waiting for him. I had a talk with a guy this week who's, who's newly married, and he was telling me, like, I, I said, how'd you meet your wife? He was like, we were at a basketball game, and, uh, and some, I was recently out of a relationship. I was not looking. I, wasn't, I was actively uh, opposed to dating anyone at all. He said, my wife, she was not looking for anyone. He said, we, you know, we, we met, and somebody introduced us, and we shook hands, and I knew. Like all my opposition, what happened there? He was moved by the Spirit, right? And he's a Christian man. She's a Christian woman. I believe God works in these things. But he said, in that moment, I knew, like, it doesn't matter. She is different than all of the other ones. But what did he have to do in that space? He still had to move. He had to talk to her. He had to ask her out. He had to build a relationship. He had to be the man God wanted him to be. When God begins to speak, hey, the promise is being fulfilled, he's often going to invite you to take steps of action along the way. The business plan has to get on paper and has to become a reality. The first chapter of the book has to be written. The prayers for forgiveness have to be prayed. The confession of sin has to occur. The extension of forgiveness has to occur. Right, the, the, the prayers for healing, those are prayers that we pray, that we enter into. The resume has to get put together and has to get sent out. Right, the work has to be done on the scholarship application. You have to buckle down and, and put in the effort on the, the homework. All of these things, God says, hey, it's time now. We're moving. Let's go. And we have to move with him. And when you move, please, please, please be like Simeon. Move with open hands, open eyes, and an open heart. Simeon, moved by the Spirit, hey, today is a day. I'm going to see the Messiah. And he walks in, and he's standing there, and he's looking around, right? And, and what's he looking for? We don't know, but, but it's, it's possible. He's looking for somebody impressive. He's looking for somebody strong. He's looking for a grown man with some natural leadership ability. He's looking for somebody that's head and shoulders taller than everyone else. He's looking for someone that just kind of the, the sees part when he walks in the room. And yet he's, he's waiting and he's praying and saying, God, is that the one? Is that the one? Is that the one? And here come Joseph and Mary with sweet little baby Jesus. And God says, that's it. And it's a baby with a poor couple. But Simeon's response is not, no, no, Lord, no. No. I have not been waiting to hold a baby. I've been waiting for the Messiah. I've been waiting for the deliverer of Israel. But Simeon has realized long ago that this isn't his promise, it's God's. And he's going to surrender it to him. And when he sees the answer, even though it's unexpected, he's going to respond in gratitude and worship. And even in his prayer, he acknowledges it. Oh, sovereign Lord. God, you're the one who's in control of all of this from beginning to end. This is all about you. And so even though the answer is unexpected... I'm going to worship you in the middle of it. And he picks up Jesus from Mary, and he begins to thank God and praise God and worship him and, and models for us this idea of when God answers in the smallest way, our first and most immediate response is worship. But his answer might not look like what you think it would. Sometimes Mr. Wright is five foot six, not six foot five. Right? Sometimes the girl of your dreams grew up on the other side of the country. Sometimes your child returns to faith, but not to church with you. Sometimes the, the job that is offered, but it's not the six-figure salary with seven weeks of vacation that you thought you deserved as a 23-year-old recent graduate. <laughs> right? I mean, I know. I was there. I thought I'd pastor a church of 1,000 people by the time I was 30. I got it, right? I get it. We always have our expectations, and sometimes God's answer is a little smaller, a little slower. And usually that's for our good and for his glory. And so our job is, Lord, you're answering, and okay, maybe the healing isn't complete and total. Maybe it's just a, a little progression. 
Maybe the depression hasn't lifted completely, but there is a a breath of joy welling up in your heart this morning. Maybe the grief hasn't gone away completely, but there's just a little more peace, a little more comfort than there was a few moments ago. And in these spaces where we sense just the smallest movements of the Spirit, our response is, thank you, Lord, that you are fulfilling your promises in my life. And sometimes those unexpected answers go in the other way. Sometimes we pray small prayers and God answers in big ways. We've got families in Christian chapel. I remember we prayed with you that just that one baby would be born. And now you're five or six down the road and you're like, hey, stop praying, everybody. Just everybody pray for somebody else, right? If we have another one, we're giving them away anyway. So just pray for somebody else. Sometimes you prayed, God, just let the small business, just let it be enough to support my family. Just let me be enough to, to where I can do the thing I'm really passionate about. And now it's grown to the point that you're thinking, why, why did I ever pray for this? You prayed for increased influence and responsibility. And now every Monday, your inbox is full, your phone's blowing up, and you're thinking, I don't have enough time to help all the people who are reaching out to me. In all of these spaces, though, we're just going to come back and we're going to say, Lord, these weren't my promises to start with. They're yours. And you answer your promises in your ways for your people. So whatever he's saying to you, however he's answering you today, or maybe you're just in the middle of the waiting process, our response is worship. And our response is to say, God, I'm going to worship you while I wait. I'm going to worship you while you answer. From beginning to end, I'm going to worship. So if you'll stand with me, I want to pray for us this morning. The band's going to come back and lead us in a a final song. Will you bow your heads and close your eyes with me? If you're here this morning and you are, are waiting, which we've already said is all of us, but specifically... You are waiting for some specific promises, for God to work in some specific areas. There are some pain points this morning where you're saying, I need God to speak, to work, to move. If that's you, will you raise your hand so I can pray for you? Lord, you see us, you see the situations, you know the details of every person's life. And we come today, Lord, just aware that your promises are your promises. They're not ours, but they're gifts that you've given to us. And so, Lord, now we stand with open hands, with open hearts to say, will you speak and will you move? God, as I worship, will you tell me the truth about who you are and about who I am? As I worship, will you begin to show me how you're at work in this season? As I worship, will you affirm to me that you have a purpose and a plan for this day and for this moment? Lord, I pray for those who, they're in the, the middle of believing lies that you don't see, you don't care, you don't know, you're not concerned, you don't have power to work and to move. Pray in these moments as we worship that you would expel the lies of the enemy from our hearts and from our minds. We come again, Lord, to worship, to be reminded of the truth of who you are and how you work. Lord, help us to see waiting not as punishment, but as a space where you work and move, where you bring growth that cannot come in any other way. Holy Spirit, we invite you to speak powerfully and personally to us. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm gonna ask our prayer team to come forward. They're gonna spread out across the front. If you're here this morning and would like someone to pray with you about promises you're waiting for, about spaces where you need God to work, we would love to pray those prayers with you. The rest of us will continue to sing uh, for just a few moments about how God works and moves in our lives.
waiting and all of our longing, whatever it might be, I hope you go today convinced that he is at work, that he is leading, he is guiding, and his promises will be fulfilled by his power and according to his plan. Thank you for worshiping him with us today. May you go in his grace and peace, full of faith that Christ is at work. My name is Chris Dow. I'm the lead pastor at Christian Chapel. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please like it, share it, leave us a comment definitely hit that subscribe button so you can enjoy more content like this in the future. If you'd like to learn more about who we are as a church, you can visit us online at christianchapel.com. I hope you have an awesome week.